learn things from um, practical experience and working with your relatives and things. So the traditional way of teaching um, pelvic floor exercises is to think about the pelvic floor. So you have the prostate, so you have the bladder, you have the prostate that's been removed, the bladder drops down onto the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is going to really struggle initially with um, not being able to hold onto that bladder volume. So what we have to do is get that pelvic floor stronger beforehand and I often identify a whole thing with bladder training as well. So if a guy's already got urgency, frequency, I'll do the lifestyle measures, I'll take him off coffee, tea, alcohol, I'll get him to do bladder expansion techniques, bladder training beforehand. We can often get a guy to that normal scenario and what that does is passively add weight to the pelvic floor anyway. So if you've got more in your bladder and you're holding it for longer, then naturally the pelvic floor will adapt to that. So if we can do that preoperatively, we're going to make it a whole lot easier postoperatively. So I always just very simply say, if you have a look at that um, basic anatomy, we have um, the pelvic floor at the base and there's two sphincters or openings. There's the back passage or the rectal sphincter and then the urinary sphincter and that works as one um, muscle. When I say to guys that this is this instructed and I try and do it by the government way, I did that for many years where I said what they ask you to do if you read through that is gently squeeze your back passage as if you're trying to stop wind breaking and then gently squeeze your front passage, your urinary sphincter to stop yourself from urinating like you're holding on and then lift up the whole thing together. So there's three points to that. Now most of the time when I ask guys to squeeze their back, squeeze their front and they're lifting up everything up, I've lost them because that's three instructions at once and that's not being derogatory to men but it's really difficult because they don't have that that wiring where they're very um, clear with what, what that muscle and what that area of their body feels like. Unlike women we have much shorter urethras and, and we have that menstrual cycle so we're, we're much more wired to that body part. So I simply say to guys now, I want you to lift your nuts to your gut. So they're just thinking of lifting their testes and everything up in one movement and that seems to be a much better way of them um, understanding it and doing it. Now saying that in the East Coast I've got a colleague who's really specialised as well in, in men's health. Um, he's also the Australian physiotherapist for the Diamond Netball team. But he's developing a technique at the moment where there's actually there's three separate components of the pelvic floor. And I haven't gone into that anatomy of the pelvic floor because um, again, I try and simplify it and break it down so guys can do it rather than being extremely scientific. So there's another whole way of doing the pelvic floor by learning about the liver to ani, the top pubococcygeus and doing everything separately. But again, on my experience, it doesn't translate so well into the everyday bloke. So nuts to guts works really well. Sounds pretty simple and it is simple. So now I just need a model. <laughs> and. I need a blue. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, I've got the nice warm gel for you. <laughs> but I like you in standing, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you've got cold hey, gel. So yeah, I've got rid of it now because he's not on it. You've got rid of the warm gel. No, no warm gel, sorry. It hasn't been so long. Sure. Yep. And I, just, I just asked the guys to do a little raise of their um, shirt, and I just want to see their navel, and then I'm basically just slapping this through how much that on. This ultrasound has been everywhere and even my kids have attacked it and lost something. So it's well travelled, I mean in line for a new one, mm. but what I'm looking for is a full bladder and I just move that around a bit. I try and ask everyone to have half a litre of fluid and not empty their bladder about an hour before. Not too much because from my own experience <laughs> if you have two litres, like they ask in pregnancy, you never make it and you end up with a problem. So looking at the bladder and the pelvic floor, so nice, Sean's got a great full bladder for me, that was just by coincidence. So can I just ask you to very gently, and I say with all due respect, lift your nuts to your gut. So just try and do everything up. And now release everything. Okay, now can I get you to do that for me ten times? So I want you to lift up and let go and lift up and let go and lift up and let go and what I'm seeing here is Sean's reaction time is really quite slow. He's taking a long time to, he can rise up and elevate but he's really slow at um, letting go and that's 
something to do with whatever's happening in his spine probably at the moment as well. Um, I want that to be more efficient. And what I've worked out with, which I did through the research with Eric, is if we get that patient to do that more quickly, their reaction time will be even faster. So I'll now do a little test where I'll say, get my mobile phone and I'll do a stopwatch and I'll go, um, uh, Sean, can you please do 10 of those as quick as you can? So I go, and you mark the set go, so you go, and they're trying to be full contractions, but he's using his abdominal, so I go, no, <laughs> Sean. Sorry, we just want you to think of everything below. There can be a minor little movement there, but we don't want that to overshadow the full contraction, so relax everything off. And let's go again, pull up, let go, as quick as you can now, pull up, let go. And he's firing away. What we often find in the patients who have poor bladder capacity is they'll lose it. They will lose their coordination. You're doing okay? Now relax it. And now let's lift, get to lift and hold it. Pull it up and hold it all up. One, two, three, four. Keep breathing. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let it go. And it's pretty buzzed by then. It didn't have very much depression whatsoever. That's because I pushed him through those rapid contractions quickly. So what I found was, thank you, Sean, that all these guys got better with their holding, because I was getting them to do as that brochure says, hold for eight seconds, do ten of them three sets a day. That's what the brochure says. That's what you're supposed to start off with. Except when I actually look at it, that's oh. only hold for one or two seconds, or, or you can't start there. That then starts to put that pacing to that feet in your are tight. They get ball pain, you know. So I go right with. Let's have a look at it, and I want to see it in a functional position. And then we make an individual program. So I'll say, guys, start at three seconds of elevation and rest it for three seconds, rather than try for eight. That will help the endurance. So then I was left with this quandary. I've got everyone that can hold their their pads, but they still got hold their bladder. Sorry, they're still needing to use one pad a day. There's this this stress and constant. They move just without even thinking. It's just the, the subtle little changes in position. So that's when I went and helped out with Eric, and I thought, wow, the pelvic floor is broken up into um, quick phase fibers, which is 20% and long holding ones which is 80%. So I just get guys to do those 10 quick ones as quick as they can on the clock and to beat their own clock time. And that seems to sort out that last um, bit of stress incontinence. So guys might start off and it might take them 20 seconds to do 10. That means two seconds reaction time each time they move. They've lost their bladder volume. But if they can get it down to between four and five seconds, which they all do, just by practicing it, they don't have that stress and confidence anymore. And the brain tends to rewire itself in that way. So that this is just where I've pioneered a test and that, that's what my research was all about last year. I think that could be translated across to all um, pelvic floor problems, men and women. And that's what I'm having to validate now at university because it was just an idea and it seemed to work. But again, I'm not, I'm not wanting to internally assess someone because first of all they're bruised and sore after their surgery and second of all I don't really feel comfortable with that te technique but no one is really from my research that into reliable between testers so grading our pelvic floor strength between one and six is going to be very different from you to you to you from its subjective testing and it's really unpleasant for all parties concerned and guys the one thing that they're happy about once their prostate out is out is they don't need that DRE anymore so I'm not going to come along and you know. But at the same time, you'd have to do it in food time, wouldn't you? Really? Or in sideline or something? It's been a not really easy to understand, is it? It's not functional, is it? It's not a functional position. No, that's what I'm thinking. Oh, the, the yeah, actual yeah. visual examination. Yeah, yeah. Which you I, get, don't have I just thought that's been done, and I'm not comfortable with that. So I'm just going to try a different way and see what happens. And that's pretty much what happens. And if I say to the women's health physio, and they're coming, they're, we're doing some stuff together now. If I say I can get patients, continent within six to twelve weeks, they laugh at me and they say, oh, you're right. And I say, but just, you, there's no point doing all these pelvic floor exercises in the perfect sitting position. Um, so I, I just try and stimulate conversation and that's what physios are great at. They're really involved and looking for new 